Welcome back to the show, everybody. Check out these headlines we have here. We got BTC Maxi shots fired on the Ethereum community here. Jay Clayton on stablecoins. You won't believe it. Marcus and Fanger from Ripple and tokenization on the XRP ledger. You're going to love it. Brad Garlinghouse, $10 trillion market. And uh-oh, Ripple is hiring and it smells like an XRP ETF. We got that and so much more. Somebody roll that beautiful intro. Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show. You can follow us on Twitter and YouTube for exclusive content. Right now, $1.69 trillion market cap for Kip Crypto. And the market is up 1.6%, $41,700 plus for Bitcoin, $2,200 plus for Ethereum. We see 96 point plus 96 billion plus uh market cap for tether and xrp at 52 cents up 1.9 on the 24 hour off by 3.6 on the seven day range of price right now between 51 and 53 cents we'll keep an eye on it let's get started ladies and gentlemen the countdown is on we're less than 100 days till xrp las vegas 2024 john deaton the former head of the secure uh, of a uh, commodities futures trade commission the honorable christian carlo co-founder of of the digital dollar project michael errington is going to be at the benefit dinner brad garlinghouse is going to be at the benefit dinner eleanor terrence is going to be on stage uphold is going to be on stage david schwartz is going to be on stage the list continues the ceo of <laughs> uphold I mean, listen so many people are going to be here and the list is growing and i'm telling you we've got something coming that you're not even seen yet but one thing you need to do is to get your ticket But one thing that I really like is I think you'll see a lot more of these neo-banking type of services come into play. I think you will start to be able to use your crypto portfolio to have a debit card and pay, or you'll be able to send money, you know, I could send money to Fabio or crypto to Fabio, just like I send Venmo today. And Fabio is going to be there with Sologenic. We're so excited to have them. They just recently came on. I tell you, the lists are growing. Go to XRPLasVegas.com to see all the new people that have signed on in companies. It is growing quickly, ladies and gentlemen. More to come. XRPLasVegas.com. Now, here it is. Jack Maulers. Oh, boy. Bitcoin Maxi Lightning Network guy. The Strike CEO. He says this. I think crypto is a load of garbage. I think it's generally a distraction to what this technology and this movement represents and is here to change. And so how the world is going to sort out the fact that some kid named Vitalik Buterin printed a lot of coins in his basement and then pre-sold them to people and has been promising all sorts of crazy things that have never happened. I don't know. Is that a security? But I, I guess the point is, I don't care. <laughs> but the point is you do care because if you bothered to mention it jack you know you wanted to throw some shade on the ethereum project right because at the end of the day jack's not wrong on this measure jack is right he's talking about ethgate and the free pass that it got very real very real you know, you have a lot of people out here that have tried to create a false narrative that, uh, you know, this the reason that XRP Ledger is not successful because we haven't had the grassroots adoption from the bottom up. And I think that's a false narrative. And I'll show you why I think it's a false narrative. It's not just because I disagree with the others that believe that. It's because I believe that they miss what it is. Ethereum has taken off and there's tons of projects built off of Ethereum. Well, there was a time when uh, XRP was in the number two spot and was ahead before the case. Might even been the reason for the case against Ripple and XRP. 
But the reality is, is that the reason that there were so many builders and projects on top of the ETH network isn't because it was such a stellar network. And I know that it's got a smart contract feature that is really unique to itself. And that's wonderful. And that's great. I'm not diminishing that. But what I am saying is, is the real reason that adoption took place on Ethereum is because it got a free pass. So let's just hold all of that for a second until we find out what real clarity looks like for this digital asset space. Then let's talk about the fact whether we're having problems with developers building on the network and what have you. you know, I got a sneaky suspicion. Once we get legal clarity, that's not a free pass, but it is legal clarity for the entire space. I don't think we're going to have any problem finding developers because they, they flock to where they believe they're going to have the safest place to build. And that's exactly what they did with Ethereum, right? So, but obviously that was done with a free pass. So we'll see. And then there's this guy. Oh boy. Yeah, I know we're not a fan, but he's going to talk about stable coins. Let's just focus on that part because we already know that Jay Clayton is not really... I'm just going to keep it. I'll just keep it here. Let's listen to what he says about stable coins. <laughs> figure out how to custody it. Then, then let's figure out how to, if we take those incremental steps, we're going to get somewhere. Going, the idea, the myth that there was going to be great legislative change that was going to revamp the securities markets, the commodities markets, create a new regulator. That was crazy. So it's interesting because obviously, uh, and I know you wrote op-eds op about this topic, about your views on stable coins, and I agree with this. There's obviously a lot of benefits that stable coins can provide. And I, and I hear you where you mentioned that um, stable coins, maybe it's, our, it's an easy, it's a layup that actually community could use because of the benefits uh, are there. Uh, you know, but the, um, the, the crypto community, to its defense, I mean, there's been numerous efforts to try to provide, obviously, the stablecoin rails, and there's numerous attempts to, and obviously, I'm not talking about algorithmic stablecoins and some of the scams out there, but on a properly regulated uh, uh, manner, uh, do, you, do you still hold the same view that, obviously, stablecoins have a lot of potential, and what do you think should could be done to bring stablecoins more mainstream, if that's a goal that you believe, from a policy perspective, we should have? I think stable coins have immense potential. I think we should facilitate truly stable stable coins in our ecosystem. The amazing amount of stable coin transactions that have taken place without a single complaint that I know of um, instantaneously across the globe. Are you kidding me? Remarkable. And we should facilitate that. Why has it taken so long? Because people have asked for much more than just that as a start. And you're, you're, talking to, you're talking to regulators and you're talking to legislators that have limited bandwidth. And if you're coming at them with 10 asks and eight are unreasonable, they're not going to filter out the two that are reasonable. And they're just going to look at this crypto community in a monolithic way and say, you know, that's just too hard. That's, that's the reality of the you know, bandwidth in the legislative process and bandwidth in the regulatory process is limited. <laughs> Well, there's another reason that that bandwidth might be limited is if you're a public figure working in an appointed office like he was and you potentially are compromised for money because <laughs> that's what I believe Jay Clayton is and Bill Hinman, right? They pimp their position out for money. That's what I believe they've done. Let's talk about stable coins this way. I, you know, I've talked, you know, yes, the on and off ramps, we got to do that. But you guys know I'm excited about real stablecoin legislation that absolutely allows the banks to come off of the sideline, the entire financial industry, and participate in using these instruments because it is the digital money of the Internet, right? It is the kind of money that can allow you to participate in a way in the world economy that you currently cannot today. Take a listen to Kevin O'Leary's comment on stable, stable coins. Stable coins could be a huge tool for us. Think about it this way. I want to buy Nestle on the Zurich Exchange. It can be done in 12 hours, but there's a lot of fees involved. If I had a stable coin, I could do that in two seconds. And there it is. And this is exactly what I've been saying about banks in the financial system. The moment we get actual legislation passed, signed into law, you're talking about the idea that banks will move to 24-7, 365. It's just the way it will be. Everything is going to begin to shape shift in a transformational way and never return. That's what's coming. And you got to be able to prepare for that. 
And there's an interesting piece here uh, about the ledger hooks. And David Schwartz talks about this from a Coindesk interview, basically. And basically what he's saying here, and I just go into this, you've begun testing new feature called hooks that would add smart contract-like functionality to the XRP ledger. What is the roadmap on that feature and how big of a deal is that for you all? Now, I want to quickly remind everybody that we have over 80% vote right now for the clawback amendment. If that holds for two weeks, that will move to the ledger. Then there's also uh, the um, the other amendment, which is automated market makers that we're waiting on and very exciting. Now, we're not there yet. That's at 60 percent, I believe it is at this point. So getting very exciting for that. But let's read on here about hooks. David Schwartz asks, you know, we had very little to do with the team building hooks, which was we'd say when, right? Uh, they met with us a couple of times and said, hey, that looks awesome. For a while, they were thinking that it could be something like the XRP ledger itself would adopt. And it still could be. But it's a very major change. It's very risky in two ways. One is a multi-billion dollar problem for a lot of people. So it's a high risk in that way. And the other way is just that we want the XRP ledger to be great for payments. And it could make it more like more Ethereum like they launched their own network using XRP Ledger's technology, and they're going to see how well that works. But if they prove that it works very well and it doesn't degrade the network for other uses, then you could see in a year or two a proposal to add it to the XRP Ledger mainnet. That's the right way to go, right? Make sure it works on its own. No bugs, no issues, doesn't compromise the integrity and design and the current function of the XRP ledger, which they know works so well now. It's very precautious, very, you know, uh, very cautious, the right approach. And it is exciting to see what would happen in a year or two from now if that comes together the right way. Because we're moving towards the tokenization of everything, the traditional markets. This is the larger reason we're here. Listen to Marcus and Fanger from Ripple say exactly that. Coming to the ledger, baby. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, having us here, having me here. Super excited to talk about this uh, probably more or most popular topic in uh, crypto this uh, year. Uh, and look, so uh, my or how am I involved with tokenization? I oversee basically with Ripple extra contributions to the XRP Ledger, which is an open source blockchain. Uh, and tokenization of real world assets has been definitely one of the key areas for us in terms of like, you know, building more native primitives to allow for compliant institutional grade tokenization, signing partnerships um, around this. And so, you know, we're seeing a lot of uh, stable coins, obviously. Uh, already as a former financial instrument represented on the XRP ledger uh, and are also seeing a couple of projects around real estate, carbon markets, and now we're really expecting to see this to grow vastly in terms of scope, um, debt, assets, securities, private equity, and so forth. Uh, and I would say, like, you know, in terms of like a year ago and now, the big difference is, um, you know, it, it felt like engaging particularly with TradFi in the beginning, maybe more than a year ago, it was mostly about like ticking an innovation box and running through some theoretical pilots. And now the conversations are really becoming real and tangible and executable. And so, you know, I, I would say it's fair to say um, that there's there's a lot um, that's going to be happening in terms of like blockchain technology, blockchain related companies, and trust by working together um, to really move the needle. And that all makes sense because we know Brad Garlinghouse told us not long ago about the 10 trillion that's going to be a market for everybody to tap into. Take a listen. The, the macro environment around custody of digital assets uh, is expected to be close to $10 trillion by the year 2030. And it, inevitably, uh, people are going to need a place to store those assets and uh, safe, secure, and they're going to need to be able to transfer them as well, having good on and off ramps, uh, even the, the t a tokenization engine, some of the work Ripple is doing around central bank digital currencies or CBDCs. So we think the, there's a lot of pieces that uh, come together. And we already had, and I remember when you and I first spoke, uh, you know, I remember being on a, a, a call with one of the largest top 10 banks in the world. And Listen to this. A, a, a bank Ripple was already working with, and they were asking mm. us about could we help them with their custody. This is prior to the medical acquisition, and 
we weren't in a position to do that. And so when we think about that synergy, the ability to say to that existing Ripple customer, hey, you know, here's a, a best in class, you know, going head to head time and time again and winning uh, on the custody uh, level, you know, to be able to bring that product to them, I think is a great opportunity for the, the two companies together. So uh, there you have it. Now he's talking about custody towards the end of that, which is interesting to me because this just happened. Ripple hires a senior manager for business development in New York with a key role related to ETFs. Oh boy. Here it is. Institutional DeFi development of, right? And there it is. What you'll do. You see it right here. Drive cryptocurrency re currencies related ETFs initiatives with internal trading team and relevant partners. Uh-huh. We love that. Now, to the point that Eleanor made uh, is, is also a point that James Seifert has made, and I think it's a valid point here. Um, as history has shown in the natural progression of introducing a spot uh, crypto ETF, you normally will have future ETFs first. So if XRP gets futures ETFs, then it's a step in the right direction to one day getting a spot. And I think that's the way to see it right there. Now let's take a look at these numbers very quickly here. Eggrag Crypto tells us XRP 21 moving average here. Uh, monthly time frame 350, 650, and $27 is what we're looking at. The most complex, uh, the most complex matters needs the simplest solutions. And if you look at this, to kick off the measures moves, I assess the movement of when XRP is positioned either above or on the 21 EMA. So that's why you're looking at the 21 EMA and getting this historical look of the last three times we saw a pump. And when it went to 350, that was a 500% rise. When it, uh, If it goes to 650, it would be a 1,000% rise. And if it were to go to 2,700 bucks, it would be a 4,500% jump. The interesting thing that has been in the history of XRP is that these jumps and rises are not pulled out of thin air. They're pulled from history. These rises, these meteoric rises, are exactly what have happened in 2017, 2018, and again in 2021. That's what we're talking about, or 2020 or 2021, whatever it was there. I know it was close, but... Um, this is what we're talking about. And if we see those same, either one of those three would give us either one of those three outcomes from where we currently sit today. But look, we just have to watch and see what happens. I firmly believe it'll take a catalyst like stable coin legislation or the settlement of the case or the OCC as well as the SEC backing out of crypto in the financial institution and stop putting the brakes on it in that regard because brad garlinghouse has made it very clear that uh the occ has been just as much a break uh at, on the pedal for crypto and digital assets in the financial system as the sec so we shall see now i hope you will come join us in the freedom zone ladies and gentlemen join us digperspectives.com and come on in because what i'm about to show you is the difference between the smp versus private equity and you're going to want it the numbers are absolutely amazing they're astounding and you won't believe it we're going to look at that inside i hope you will join us not financial advice or me or anyone else we're going into the freedom zone come on in